Hello, and welcome to episode five of the Dorothy L. Sayers podcast. I'm Lindsay Ann Scholl, and I stole the title from today's episode straight from Sayers herself. But first, a biographical reminder. Sayers was born in 1893. She passed away in 1957. She married a World War I vet, a journalist, and an amateur chef named Mac Atherton Fleming. Yeah, all one guy, not three different people. She married Mac Fleming in 1926, and they stayed married until his death in 1950. They didn't have any kids, but she did have one child, which is a completely different story from an earlier situation. Just in case you were wondering. But let's get started. So, listener Tom keeps asking for Sayers jokes. And I keep telling him that I don't make up jokes, or at least I don't make up good jokes. And he keeps asking for jokes still, and I keep telling him that I don't make up jokes, and so on and so forth. So here's one for Tom, and for anybody who listened to the last podcast episode, episode four. Question. Why does Christmas divide Dorothy L. Sayers, the writer, from Dorothy Sayers, the music hall performer? Answer. The musical hall performer celebrates Noel. Okay, that was painful. Let's keep going. Today's episode is entitled, Why Work? And I mentioned her essay, her lecture turned essay, Why Work, that was uh, written in 1942 in a previous episode. And I've already talked about it in the context of waste and trash, rubbish, and so on and so forth. But clearly the essay is more than that because it's entitled, Why Work? Not Why Waste? We work to feed our families. But Sayers reminds us that we habitually think about work as something that one does to make money. And this idea is, quote, so ingrained in us that we can scarcely imagine anything else. But this is turned around. We should work because of the work being done. We should not ask, will it pay? But is it good? And by the way, all the quotes I'm taking today are from her essay, Why Work? Again, that's from Letters to a Diminished Church. Uh, in W Publishing Group 2004 is, is where you can find this essay lots of different places, but you can find it there too. And that publication is a very nice publication. It has a picture of a tree and a fence and papers flying around on it. Okay, so we should ask, not, quote, will it pay, but, quote, is it good? And she starts with this picture of a man's relationship to the product or the, not a man, a, a corporation's relationship to the product. Shareholders in let us say, brewing companies, would astonish the directorate by rising at shareholders' meetings and demanding to know not merely where the profits go or what dividends are to be paid, not merely whether the workers' wages are sufficient and the conditions of labor satisfactory, but loudly and with a proper sense of personal responsibility, what goes in to the beer? Now, she thinks that this is a pretty radical point of view, and as she keeps talking, you'll see that it is. And I want you, as we go, to set aside your, I don't know if you need to set aside your economic mind, but set aside your questions and your uh, kind of the society we're in, which is very much a money-based society. Don't set, okay, set aside whatever you want. I don't care. But I do want you to catch the vision. It's easy to come up with questions about it. It's easy to say, hey, but hold on, Sayers. This is not going to work for X, Y, and Z. But first, try to catch the vision. And then if you can catch the vision, you'll see that the questions are worth asking and worth dealing with, but you'll have a lot more motivation to just to try to answer them instead of just saying, oh, I've got a question. She's obviously wrong. So she gives us two powerful contradictory examples of this vision of asking, is a work good? Is a worth is a work worth the thing being produced? OK, so the first one is war. And again, she says in war. Production for wasteful consumption still goes on. And she talks or she talks elsewhere like it's getting blown away, literally. But there is one great difference in the goods produced. None of them is valued for what it will fetch, but only for what it is worth in itself. The gun and the tank, the airplane and the warship have to be the best of their kind. A war consumer does not buy shoddy. He does not buy to sell again. He buys a thing that is good for its purpose, asking nothing of it, but that it shall do the job that it has to do. Once again, war forces a consumer into the right attitude to the work. Why do we work? We work not because we need to make money, but we work because we want the product of that work. And the case of war is pretty compelling. Obviously, she's living through it at this time. 
but it's like medicine. You make theoretically, you make medicine so that it's effective. That's his chief goal. Another maybe more positive vision of uh, a situation where the economy is driven by things because the products are good, not because they sell, are hobbies. We know that there can be satisfaction in doing good work because people have hobbies. And she says, picture this, a man will put loving labor into some hobby, which can never bring him any economically adequate return. His satisfaction comes in the godlike manner from looking upon what he has made and finding it very good. He's no longer bargaining with his work, but serving it. It is only when work has to be looked on as a means to gain that it becomes hateful. And then she goes on, then it becomes, it really, it becomes a, a problem. So if you've been in a hobby or you know somebody who's kind of deep into a hobby, you have seen this. You see that somebody will spend four hours and it's dinner time and they've been working on the same thing for four hours and you're thinking, what is the deal? But they're, they're so focused on it and they will spend money on it and they will spend time on it. And it's really a beautiful thing, provided that your hobby isn't a, serving a good dinner and that they're putting that off. She puts all of this stuff about work in what she calls a doctrinal proposition. And it is this. Work is a natural exercise and function of man. Say that again. Work is a natural exercise and function of man. Implication of this, guys, if you're believing in Christian theology, implication of this is that Adam was working before he fell. So work isn't bad. He's born. It's born. It's born into him. But you think, yes, yeah, sure, of course, we, we know this. But think about some of the implications as we go. This premise leads to other truths, such as work is primarily not a thing one does to live, but the thing one lives to do. You should find spiritual, mental, and bodily satisfaction in your work. And if we accepted this premise as a society, the premise that work is a thing one lives to do, Sayer says that there would be profound consequences, so profound as to overshadow all political revolutions. In fact, she says political revolutions would look like conformity, she didn't say conformist revolutions, but they would look conformative, conform, conform, conformity is what she says. Anyway, they wouldn't be revolutionary at all. So if we say work is the thing one lives to do, these are some of the consequences that would come about. One, if a worker serves a work, loves a work, profit would not be an issue. She says this, so long as society provides a worker with a sufficient return in real wealth to enable him to carry on to the work properly, then he has his reward. For his work is a measure of his life and his satisfaction is found in the fulfillment of his own nature and a contemplation of the perfection of his work. Okay, so if a worker serves a work, profit's not an issue because he doesn't need extra money because what would he use the extra money for? He needs, he, he's just, he's enjoying the work itself. That's what he wants. Now, a sub-consequence is that um, she says what most of us demand from society is that we should always get out of it a little more than the value of the labor we give to it. Let me just say that again a little slower. What most of us demand from society is that we should always get out of it a little more than the labor we put into it. By this process, we persuade ourselves that society is always in our debt, a conviction that not only piles up actual financial burdens, but leaves us with a grudge against society. First consequence, the work itself would be the reward. Second consequence, the worker would be fitted to the work instead of the work being done by people whose labor came cheapest. In other words, the right men and the right women would be in the right jobs. Now, uh, this is one of Sayer's more uh, prophetic moments. That's so probably too strong. But we now, in 2020, we're in an age of personality types. We have the Myers-Briggs personality types. Are you an ISFP? Are you an ENFJ? Are you an ESTP? I think I've taken the test a couple of times and I still can't remember what they are. We've got the Enneagram. We have Facebook quizzes. What Harry Potter character are you? There's something like, I think I took a quiz once where am I fire or am I, a, am I woods or am I a glacier? So there's lots of different avenues to finding out more about myself. And it gets kind of silly many times. On the other hand, we are very concerned with how we fit with our surroundings, how we fit with our jobs. We don't want to put a square peg in a round hole if we can help it. Sayers would have appreciated this effort to direct people in the direction they're fitted to go. 
She herself felt this pressure to do work to which she did not feel called. And we talked about this in her discussion with Lewis in episode one. She didn't want to, even though she herself was a writer, she didn't feel confident writing everything. She wrote about theology, but she didn't confident didn't feel confident writing about everything in theology. Also, we didn't talk about this in episode one, but she tried to be a teacher. Those were some of the jobs that were available when she got out of college, and that didn't work out. On a on a on paper, she would have made a great teacher. She was vivacious, she was articulate, she was organized, she was a bit of a workaholic. She got along well with kids when she encountered them. On paper, she would have been great, but she saw that it just wasn't a good match. And so she tried a bit of it and and stopped and took to rather, you know, kind of scratching to make ends meet in London rather than have a nice, solid teaching job. So she does know what she's talking about when she's talking about square pegs and round holes. And on a side, side note, she wrote this essay called Lost Tools of Learning. And this is many years after she became an established writer. And that essay, we'll do a whole other episode or podcast on that, although I think many podcasts have already been done on it. That essay is foundational for the modern classical education movement and is so ironic because she herself did not consider herself a teacher. And yet she writes this essay that has significantly changed education for at least some people. Okay, let's back up. Side side note, let's get back to the main point. The third consequence of if society accepts the premise that work is a thing one lives to do. If we really believed that work is a natural exercise and function of man, then, quote, we should no longer think of work as something that we hasten to get through in order to enjoy our leisure. We should look on leisure as a period of change rhythm that refreshes us for the delightful purpose of getting on with our work. End quote. We'd actually be fighting to get on with the job. We'd be fighting to get back to that hobby, but it's now not a hobby. It's actually something we get to spend our day job doing. So that would be pretty cool. Instead of, um, okay, wait, no, I'm, I'm going to go I'm getting ahead of myself. Consequence four, we should fight to do the work worth doing, in which case we would take pride in our work. There would be a sense of personal ownership of it. Protests and strikes would still exist, but they would be aimed not towards more pay, but towards better products. You know, you'd be striking in the street thinking, I want this beer to be better than what it is. Directorate, make it better. Or I think this car should be more streamlined and it's not. And I'm protesting. That would be so cool if that actually is what happened. And this is a vision she's trying to create. Now, there's another premise that comes out of the idea that work is a natural function of man, and it applies to the church. So we had like this list of four consequences that come from this idea that work is a thing one lives to do and this cool picture of how that would affect us. But outside of the idea that uh, another implication of the, the idea that man, work is a natural function of man applies to the church. And it is that it is a business of the church to recognize the secular vocation as sacred Again, this has echoes of her discussion with C.S. Lewis. Although the church affirms that secular work can be sacred, Sayer says it's actually a lot harder to see it in practice. And she's got this great imagery here about how the church should approach a carpenter. So, And we still have carpenters. So, you know, a carpenter, man, that is a universal trade, isn't it? Doesn't every culture in every age have cabinets? thinking about that for a second. Every culture, every age has cabinets. You know, plumbing, not always. Welding, definitely not. Electricity, definitely not. But carpentry, yeah, that's um, that's still around. Okay, we're getting back to the point here. Okay, she says this. The church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined, confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sundays. What the church should be telling him is this that the very first demand that his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. And I think that this is, uh, you know, as I kind of talk through these points in the podcast, it seems like, yeah, yeah, okay, I get that. Yeah, sure, we want to have good products. But I think when she says it like this, I start thinking, whoa, Sayers, you are making a, a point that is not being exercised right now. I have never heard from Sunday school that I need to be, I'm a teacher by trade. I've never heard from Sunday school that I need to be a better teacher because I'm a Christian and I'm a teacher. Now 
I'm sure that if I were somebody were to talk with me about it, they would say that, but never from the pulpit, you need to do a better job at welding. Let's say that you're a fashion designer and you come in like a slob to church. Would somebody take you aside and say, look, you know, you're identifying yourself as a fashion designer and you're looking like this. I don't think that that's good. So I'm not sure how that would all play out, but it does broaden the view of the church in a pretty cool way that it's this all sacred. And if you want to get all platonic on it, then being is all being is good and existence is good. And so therefore there's a level of um, sacredness all around us and in everything we find in the work of our hands. She gives a story about an encounter she had with this a play that she, she wrote a play called zeal of thy house. And it's a play about an architect of Canterbury cathedral. I may have mentioned it already, but she says that when she did zeal of thy house, it, it was produced for can it was produced in Canterbury Cathedral as part of a kind of a play cycle that they would do. T.S. Eliot also wrote a play for them, which is pretty cool. It was popular. And so it, they went on to produce it in London. And when it was produced in London, she got a letter from what she calls a dear old pious lady who was much struck by the beauty of the angels. And these archangels in the play were standing on, uh, they were 11 feet high. They were on platforms. 11 feet from wingtip to sandal tip, as Sayers says. They had gold robes that were heavy, and they looked just really archangelly. And the lady who was writing Sayers says, asked, quote, whether I selected the actors who played the angels for the excellence of their moral character. So were these good actors, moral actors, who played angels? And Sayers responds that, first, I didn't select them. That's the job of the producer. I'm just the writer of the play. Second, they were selected because of their height. They were selected because of their looks. They were selected because of their athletic ability so they could stand for long periods of time on the platform. And they were selected if they could act. Those were the criteria that went into this. And to the extent that any moral criteria was being considered, it was that can they show up to work sober and on time? Because that's a moral criteria. Now, after all of that, the un other criteria was that his behavior for the angel wasn't scandalous to the company. And we move on. And then Sayers kind of goes into why the church doesn't, doesn't really do good work all the time because they're looking for piety in, uh, they're looking for, they're not looking for quality in the work. They're looking for piety in the work. And that's a different thing. She has a lot more to say in this essay, Why Work? But I want to put the pause button on here. And in the episode today, well, I say in, there's still a big chunk left, but this is going to take a little bit. With some feedback that I received on episode one, again, that involved an argument with C.S. Lewis. And this is from an email from one of my students. And she gave me permission to share some of this. So, Helen, I'm sharing it. I hope I read you right. Now, if y'all remember in episode one, we talked about Christians doing Christian work that they think is out of their depth. C.S. Lewis had asked Sayers to contribute to a book for young people. And for some reason, she felt that it was out of her line. So, hang on, I'm, I'm, getting, up, I'm getting her email right now. She sent this an email to me, and of course, I sort of messed up my iPad. You know, when things go to sleep on you, it's hard to wake them up in the order that they should be woken up in. Okay, here we go. So, my student wrote to me, said she has some thoughts about episode one. And in episode one, C.S. Lewis had asked Sayers to contribute this book. She felt it was out of her line, uh, and this provoked a discussion of Christians as artists, and an artistic conscience is it different than an actual conscience. You know, if you betray an artistic conscience, what, you're like qualifying it. That's like saying... Um, well, I don't know what it's like saying, but it's like it's, it's undermining. It's just a conscience, whether it's artistic or not. So Helen gave me some extra good material to chew on. And one of them was how Lewis Lewis's perspective on these things. And she did a little extra research for me. Or maybe she already knew this from the top of her head. I wouldn't be surprised that he likely agrees with Sayers. And she pointed me to mere Christianity. And she's got this quote here from from Lewis. And he says this. 
uh, he's talking about that the clergy should get whether or not the clergy should get involved in something like economics or government. That is silly, he says. The clergy are those particular people within the whole church who have been specially trained and set aside to look after what concerns us as creatures who are going to live forever. And we are asking them to do quite a different job for which they have not been trained. The job is really on us, the laymen. The application of Christian principles, say, to trade union, unionism or education must come from Christian trade unionists or Christian schoolmasters, just as Christian literature comes from Christian novelists and dramatists, not from the bench of bishops getting together and trying to write plays and novels in their spare time. So Helen points out that Sayers is opposed to writing on a theological subject, which is out of her depth. And Lewis is opposed to clergymen writing Christian literature in their spare time, preferring it to be done by actual writers instead. So she points out that they're really on the same page. And Helen, I agree. I think that, uh, well, I mean, this does happen with a lot of arguments. People are really largely in the same camp, but like maybe a little bit on the margins. There's a little bit of differentiation and they realize they agree in the end anyway. So it also makes you wonder what is going on in Britain at this time that is making Sayers and Lewis, both successful writers, write about this very issue, about uh, writers writing stuff and non-writers not writing stuff. So it kind of makes you wonder what, what kind of pressures are around them that we're not aware of. Helen also pointed me to a journal entry from the founder of Methodism, John Wesley. And she says, or she quotes this, this is from Saturday, March 4th from his journal, John Wesley's journal. I found my brother at Oxford recovering from his pleurisy, 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 and with him, Peter Bowler, by whom in the hand of the great God, I was on Sunday the 5th, clearly convinced of unbelief of the want of that faith, whereby alone we are saved. Immediately it struck into my heart, leave off preaching. How can you preach to others who have not faith yourself? I asked Bowler whether he thought I should leave it off or not. He answered by no means. I asked, but what can I preach? He said, Preach faith till you have it, and then, because you have it, you will preach faith. Preach faith until you have it, and then, because you have it, you will preach faith. So Helen points out that Wesley's, Bowler's advice to Wesley is kind of a version of fake it till you make it, which she wonders whether or not that that, does that work when you're preaching? And when you're trying to get an idea across, can you fake it till you make it? Because you could also say, well, you can't give what you don't have. And that's a good question. And she goes on to say that um, maybe, say, I mean, Wesley had a very successful preaching career. And maybe he person he should have been preaching to was himself, maybe. Uh, I don't I don't know how all of that plays out. But there is one other thing I'd like to throw into this conversation of doing things that doing a work uh depending on where you are in relation to that work. And what I want to throw in this conversation is actually way back from the 400s when St. Augustine was fighting a group called the Donatists. Not going to say much about the Donatists here, except that they believed that if you were baptized by a priest who was unworthy, that the baptism was unworthy. So if you had a priest who denied the faith, but he baptized you, then your baptism doesn't count. And Augustine fights hard to get the church to accept that the power is in the baptism. The power is not in the priest. Baptism is effective even if the priest or pastor baptizing has a problem, is sinning or whatever. And this has been the position of the Western church since Augustine. It's the same thing for communion, by the way. The Council of Trent, which is much later than, much, much later than Augustine, says that the worth of the sacrifice does not depend essentially upon the one through whose ministry it is offered, but on the worth of the victim and on the dignity of the chief priest, no other than Jesus Christ himself. So the church, in when it's talking about sacraments, which is a giving of grace, the church does say that the worth is in the work. And Sayers maybe is cheering at this because she really believes strongly in the creeds of the church and would love to see the creeds related to her idea of the worth is in the work. So maybe it's more profound than we think. Hey, thank you guys for listening as we talk through this issue. And if you want to find any more of my own writing or more th information about Sayers, you can find it at www.lindsayannwithanescholl.com. That's 
I mean, the, you don't write out in with an E, it's just there, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-A-N-N-E-S-C-H-O-L-L. Or you can email me. I, you know, I heard from Helen, and I would love to hear your thoughts. You can email me at lindsayanshoal at gmail.com. I want to wish you peace, Pax Fobiscum, and we'll talk soon. <laughs>